Welcome back to day three in the Teradek booth of NAB 2017. I'm Sarah Radel with Immersive Shooter and we have a really great panel today. It's packed in here, um, but we do have a new co-host, Sarah Hill, the CEO of Story Up Studios, who's sitting on the far end of the couchway over there. Um, so you'll see her in a minute. Uh, Robert, unfortunately, had to go back and teach his class. He's got responsibilities. We're all, this is our job. So here we are. Um, our panel today is 360. Is it going to be the new 3D TV? Is it here to stay? Is it hype? Where, where are we? Um, so our panelists are on the far end, Socrates Lozano is the National Technology Coordinator and Photojournalist for EW Scripps Company's National News Desk in Denver. He's helped coordinate coverage of large-scale news events, including the presidential inauguration, among others, while implementing new tech for the modern newsroom. Our next guest is Shelly Andigan. Uh, Shelly is the head of post-production and operations at 3D Paint FX and has overseen the completion of nearly 20 VR projects last year alone, including pieces for the New York Times, Samsung VR and the United Nations. And our next guest is Armando Kerwin, who is the co-founder of Milk VR and has worked for several leading VR companies, including Here Be Dragons and Facebook. And our next guest is Jason Diamond, who is a partner and director of Supersphere VR. And our next guest, our last guest, is Angel Manuel Soto, who directs and supervises VR content for Riot. Uh, so let's just jump right in. I guess our first question is, what are the most common things that you guys are hearing haters say? Jason, I know we talked a little bit about this on the phone, so I'm going to let you oh take, take lead on it. Uh, I think probably, I, you know, people like to naysay stuff yeah. regardless. Um, I think that, I don't know what haters are saying, but from my perspective, I'm interested in the tech, the, the apex of technology and and creative, and for my nerd brain, it's all kind of VR makes sense to me in that sense. So I'm kind of riding the riding, looking for the you know point of entry at the end of the road to see where it's going to go. And if it goes nowhere, then I had a great time. And if it goes somewhere, and I can make even cooler stuff. So if the haters are right, you're just along That's for right. the ride. So it doesn't matter to me, yeah. So Socrates, since you're sort of trying to implement new tech in the newsroom, I'm sure you get a lot of pushback because it's all about the ROI and making sure that it fits into the priorities. How are you doing that? Yeah, what are you doing? One of the main issues just in general is, is the workflow isn't easy. So for us in a news application, um, shooting and, and creating has to be fast, has to be streamlined, and has to be able to be shared out at a fairly rapid rate. 360 video, from a creator standpoint, is a lot slower process to handle. So a lot of people have very valid points when it comes to like, it's dumb, it sucks, you know, I don't understand it. Um, putting on a headset right now is still super clunky, um, but there's something organic in the mobile experience. I, I kind of, I don't like the headset experience. I, I don't, I think it's cool sometimes, but I don't like it at all. Um, I don't like the feel of it. Um, but on the, on the production side of it, there's something more organic of doing a 360 degree story and gathering a 360 degree story that you can't get when shooting 2D traditional video. Like what, can you give me some examples? Yeah, one of the, the comfort level of, of subjects. I don't know, I don't know what your guys' experiences have been, but anytime I'm out getting a story, I feel like I have to work harder when I, when I shoot a 2D story because you come, you have all this equipment, you have, you have talent, you have producers sometimes, so there's a lot going on. Um, so basically everybody that's around, they can't really relax, right? Because you have this huge camera, you have this huge crew sometimes, and so there's a lot going on. So people try to act normal, but they can't because you're just in the way. But a 360 camera, depending on the story that you're doing, you set it and forget it for the most part. Um, so it's easier to interview people. People relax a lot sooner than they normally would because it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a work in progress. You know, you have to get your subjects to trust you, and I feel like they trust you a lot easier when you're shooting a VR story as opposed to a traditional 2D story. Interesting. Uh, Angel, what do you think about that? Have you had ease, ease like interacting with your interview subjects? Has that been difficult? Um, well, <clears throat> at Riot, when doing with all these documentaries and all this stuff, we like to spend time with the subject a little bit before sticking it right on their faces. So when you start developing a little bit of relationship, it, came, it comes natural, like he says. It's, if I thought it was going to be harder because you come from the concept that you need to make eye contact with the, with the person that you're talking to. Um, but I noticed that it's actually more liberating to them as they just see it as an object that's not judging them. 
and they just talk to it as if it was a person, but it's very, very natural. It comes out very organic in such a way. Sort of like the VR seems version like of the Interatron. Yeah. You know. It seems like um, it, the responses are more candid. Yeah. Because perhaps they feel, I mean, literally they are the only person in the room. Yeah. And had I known that in the fixed frame world, when we uh, did docs and, and uh, pieces in the fixed frame world, I would have never been in the room when I was yeah. interviewing him. I would have been hiding somewhere, but that was the only way that we found out yeah. to know yeah. that. Was That's the Errol Morris trick, the Interatron, yeah. where he's like, you know, it's 30 feet away looking through mirrors, yeah. you know, so people can eyeball the lens. But yeah. also people don't, a lot of people haven't seen a 360 camera before, so they don't even know what it is to be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like a big giant camera that they see a lens looking at them. But then also if you tell them that's somebody's face, like you're gonna, whoever puts on a headset, if you look at the camera, you're gonna be looking at somebody. Uh, I think that actually makes Mm -hmm. People click a little more like they're having a conversation a with, the, with yeah. the camera. Yeah, very cool. And Sarah, I know you have a tip, and I love your tip for interviewing subjects. Can you quickly share that with us? Marco Polo? Marco Polo okay. and your uh, your sticky notes. High so tech. Um, we find that if we give them individuals any more than three questions at a time, sometimes they have difficulties remembering it. So we give them a post-it note, and we, we write it down. Um, but also we found that when we're hiding in bathrooms behind rocks, um, in the jungle, wherever, that you didn't know when they were finished because you could, couldn't always monitor that audio remotely. Sometimes you could, but sometimes you couldn't. So you would wait there, and they would just wait there standing at the camera for literally like, you know, two minutes. So there was no indication to know when the other individual was done. So we developed a system, um, and we tell our interview subjects, when you're done, say Marco, and we'll c yell Marco, and we'll come out and say Polo. And that indicates that you're done with the, the Yeah, interview. it feels less rude than like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so who, who has heard from haters? Like who is getting pushback from the people you're working with for your 360 content? Anyone? Or are you, is everyone just I like mean, on, in agreement? On, on a daily basis? No, I'm, no there's, there's a lot of things. The, the medium in general is still trying to find its place. And, and especially when it, when it comes to real world journalism, it's, it's a very hard space to navigate in general. I think until the, the resolution gets good enough. Mm -hmm. I remember last year, GoPro um, was was showing off some sort of VR VR experience, and they the way they framed it was, "Hey, put this on, it's going to totally blow your mind." I'm like, "Oh, sweet!" I put it on, and I watched it, and I was super disappointed. And by the end of it, he's like, "So, what did you think?" All excited. I'm like, "Well, if this was 1994, I would think that was kind of cool, but like, this isn't 1994, you know." Like, so there's a lot of work to be done there's, mm -hmm. that we still need to do, um, but the potential is there, but. If I'm experiencing that as, a, as an end user, as a creator, um, and appreciating, appreciating the, the art of storytelling, you know, what is everybody else thinking from the general public? You know, the, so the experience isn't there yet. Yeah. yeah. Armando, have you found it easier to sell 360 as you've been moving forward and there have been better experiences coming out and more people are engaging at, in it as a co-founder co um, of Milk VR? Well, I, I work in a different part of the industry, you know, so I work with big brands that have the budgets to do a different scale of production. Um, so our work generally has been, whether it was at Facebook or Here We Dragons or Milk VR, has been kind of more well received because um, we've had a lot more to play with. But as far as 360 is concerned, it's true that um, some people wonder if it's enough. You know, and the, and the reference is, is 3D televisions like, or 3D movies. Like, you could say those never caught on because they only improved movies like 1% maybe or something, maybe not. But it wasn't like this amazing, like next level type technology. And the reason, I have two things to say about that. One, perhaps it wasn't enough of an innovation, but also it didn't really affect the way we told stories. So if you look at technologies that have been adopted by filmmakers, for example, editing and sound like really changed the way we told stories. And so what's crucial for VR is that we incorporate technologies that change storytelling. So 360 has, does have its own storytelling language a little bit, but looking to the future um, with like interactivity, not games, but interactive video-based experiences, it might start to feel like so completely different that it's no longer a subject of debate. Gotcha, absolutely. And Shelly, I mean, I think we're all evangelists of the industry. I think you kind of have to be when you're an early adopter of any technology. What do you say when people are like, 360, VR, I don't get it, that's not going to catch on? Well, I think all these gentlemen were speaking to the fact that a lot of people question, is this a flash in the pan type of technology? Is it 
like stereo uh, where you know everyone's oh it's a new shiny toy and then a couple years later it's only really theatrically applicable is that what's happening I think the difference here with VR is we have not only tech being pushed by companies like Samsung that are and New York Times actually who are kind of providing the public with incentive to get headsets and consume content, but we also, on the content side, have a lot more creators behind this medium that are kind of, you know, pushing it forward. Whereas in stereo, it kind of took a really long time, and that's why consumers were kind of like, ah, I'm not really sure I want to spend the extra money on a whole different TV when there's like two channels that I can actually use it for. You know, so it's a little bit different with VR, and I think that's what we're all hoping is that whether it's, you know, gaming or 360 content, that it will be kind of a really big splash and that it's a new way of storytelling, like Armand just said. I, I think from an analytics standpoint, too, there's data to show that immersive media is more engaging than, than fixed frame or flat media, not only in likes and shares. We know that it's it's shared up to seven times in, in the browser even, not in a, in a headset. Um, and that there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer sharing going on. People will pass it off to, to people in person, not just share online. And also, you know, even from the, the brain perspective, um, you know, at StoryUp, we're, we're story nerds with brain nerds, and we're looking at what these immersive media experiences do to the brain. And flat media has a very, ha has a different brainwave pattern than immersive media. So um, when even you're looking for, even when you're looking for uh, engagement, um, you know, the brain doesn't lie. Yeah, interesting. And I think, uh, I was gonna say, I think you had an interesting point, just stuff that I think about, which is one of the reasons I think 3D didn't catch on is because it's really hard to achieve ubiquity with a single use object, like a 3D TV, that's it, really, and mm -hmm. that's really the only thing it does, right? VR has multiple um, uses, like a phone can do VR and can do 40 other things, and you always have it on you, right? Mm -hmm. Your PlayStation does 40 other things, it also does VR. So there, there are value adds that help VR, and there's also tons of parallel development. Like, computers are gonna get better regardless of VR. Phones and screens, displays and processing, they're all being developed to get faster regardless of VR, but VR can take you know, advantage of it to move forward faster. Uh, so I think the ubiquity is what helps it move forward, not uh, you know, single use type mm. things. And I'm going to poke the beehive here and ask if there was one thing that's going to prevent 360 VR content from taking off, what do you think it would be? I want some hunches. Be, be honest, be real. It's time to get it's real. Distribution here. and delivery, really. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. The I mean, the, the, the headsets players. are the limiting factor yeah. right now. Yeah. But to, the, to your point, like Samsung, Google, you know. Facebook, like these are very large companies and they all want to sell as many headsets as possible and it's distributed, it's not mm -hmm. just, like you were saying, it's yeah. not just about one version of this being like the 3D. Um, so I personally think that it's going to reach, you know, a point in the future where there are lots of people with headsets. Um, What's your hunch? When will that be? Look into your crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they're all taking a different approach, but like Google is doing a lot of good work right now as far as making cameras that are accessible to a lot more creators. And hopefully the next step will be to look at the other side of the market and figure out how to increase the number of headsets. And, and Daydream is their platform and, the, and they launched their first headset um, a few months ago. But every Android phone in 2017 so far, every single one is Daydream compatible. So they're, again, going to multiple manufacturers and things like that. There are about 2 million active users right now, monthly active users with headsets, um, which is obviously is nothing compared to you know what like we're used to talking about. Um, but hopefully it'll be more of an exponential curve. You know, like there was the hype cycle and it kind of ended and now we're entering steady growth. And the question mm -hmm. is, is it going to go like this or is it going to go like that? We don't yeah, really so know. Yeah, so sort of baking it into what people already have before they even know that their phone is VR capable. So when they're right. ready for it, they're ready for it. Um, so talking about uh, the need for so much content being a really big challenge in the industry, I know, Shelly, you're talking about post-production, which is one of the most frustrating parts. You've got, you know, you're trying to fit it into an existing uh, newsroom structure, Socrates. And then, you know, Riot has done a wonderful job. So I'd love to hear from the three of you, like, what are the biggest challenges you're facing 
to to build the content so that people want to buy a headset, want to watch this? Um, well, well, part of that is is you have to bring you have to bring the media to the, where you get the most eyes, and right now that's on broadcast. So there's there's kind of a disparity between broadcast because this experience is more of a digital experience, right? To to immerse the audience in it, you have to post it on digital, but you want to engage with people that that avenue to do it is on broadcast. So one of the challenges that the EW Scripts company faces is, is how do we how do we bridge that gap? How do we how do we do an immersive story, create an immersive story, and then show it off within broad the broadcast group? Um, and that's one of the, the one of the challenges is is kind of bridging that gap. So you can create and you can air uh, an immersive story on broadcast but the presentation of that has to be different so that's one of the things that we're challenged with right now is, is trying to figure out the best way of doing it to in give the audience an incentive saying oh that's kind of cool I like what I see I'm gonna go on digital and experience that and so we're, we're starting on a small scale but using our broadcast platform to try to introduce a new set of audience to to immersive storytelling that's awesome yeah we pretty much flood social media with content. <clears throat> um, at first it was like, let's just get it out there so that people can see it. <clears throat> Sorry. Then we started finding out that the gimmick of the 360 was not enough. So now we need to focus on the storytelling aspect of it. So let's try to make it very good, very engaging so that people will actually watch it more than three times, share it. So that took a little bit more time of the pre-production. But now people are getting used to the quality. So now you need to up the quality. So there you go, some limitations with the camera or parallax, parallax lines or like a little bit more time on the stitching. So therefore, quantity shrinks a little bit, but quality goes a little bit up. So you kind of like have a balance right now. We were doing something with Google called the turnaround. We, we had to like release a breaking news in 48 hours, all yeah. shot with the jump. It needed to be like, we went to Haiti, shot, like from the moment we shot in Haiti, it needed to be published in 48 hours. So we managed to do it. We did like the first one 48, 48 hours, then you do a second bigger piece in a week. So there's like, it is possible with algorithms like the jump algorithm and you know, all those cloud stitching uh, helps a lot. Um, but and still- fast internet connection. And fast internet, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we had to like literally fly from Haiti right. to Miami, try to send yeah. it from Miami. So. And how, how much, <laughs> how many hours of sleep did you get within that 48 hours? Oh, yeah. dude. Sleep? None. None. Sleep? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it, it, it was kind of, the adrenaline was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do it like once a month. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a 48 hour film it's festival. A 48 yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely one of the challenges, you yeah. know, in, in the broadcast world, Traditionally, I mean, you can turn a story pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's it's educating the people that we work with oftentimes. It's like, hey, I'm going to send you, I went to Gatlinburg after after the fires devastated the town there. And my news manager says, hey, we're going to send you to Gatlinburg. Um, and we want that story the same day. And I'm like, uh, I could try. I was like, but realistically, I could maybe get it to you the next day. So I pulled an all-nighter. Con conversion and, and stitching took the longest time, and yeah, then of I course. jammed through the story, and then I exported out, and it was ready to go but by 5 a.m. that day. <laughs> I didn't sleep at all. Keep in mind that three years ago, like when we were starting, it used to take us five months. Yeah. Actual yeah. five <laughs> months to make a five to ten minute film. The <laughs> fact that you can do it in 48 hours yeah. three years later mm -hmm. is completely insane. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because of the companies involved in driving the technology. So that's why I'm I'm a believer, quote unquote, because they're not going to stop here. Like you're going to have six hour turnaround soon, and then or real two time hour, live or real stitching time that's and, as on the same yeah quality as mm -hmm. you know. It went posted. from from five months to, to two days in three years. <laughs> so where are we going to be in another year? Yeah. You know? uh, I wanted to speak to something that you all touched upon is educating clients and just people in general who want this kind of product. That's one I think one of the biggest challenges that we have because people are so used to this quick news type turnaround that they're they don't quite understand the technology so they don't understand the work that goes into it. And like you said, just the processing alone, you know, just uploading the data sometimes can take days and days for just a short, you know, like four or five minute project. So that, depending on where you are. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that that to a major company, they, they don't quite comprehend mm -hmm. that. And um, a lot of times we're, try, we're trying to be forced into like a commercial type format when that's not what this is. You have 
basically film quality footage, you know, that kind of output that's being requested of you, but on a more massive scale because you're shooting with two, four, eight, 16, maybe even 24 cameras, depending on which camera rig you're using. So just that much data that is involved, that much work that to extrapolate it and to actually stitch it together. If you're using a live stitch, that's still gonna take yeah, time, time, you know, to, to just download it. But then if you're using a team like we use at 3D Paint FX, you have, you know, artists that are perfecting the scene crossings and things like that. Um, on, you know, projects that we've worked on together, you could see it's just, it's very different from like a news feed where you're, you're not so much caring if some background person is, you know, kind of morphed. But of course, on something that's major, like mm -hmm. what Armando works on, mm -hmm. they're not only that, but they're like, um, this hair is a little bit off. And you're like, wait, this is a totally new medium. What do you mean? Yeah. You know, I mean, but that's that's what's being asked of us. So just kind of sharing that with major corporations and even smaller ones is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, we did some fashion week work and the client uh, big brand was like, we send them the cut, they approve it, they go, uh, when do we get the hair and beauty pass? And we're like, right. uh, you're not getting that. You know, you're not gonna see it anyway, but no, it's not gonna happen, you know. Uh, but then we, in the fall, we did uh, a piece for Volvo and they asked us, we did both a 30 second TV spot and a three minute VR experience and they wanted them to be at the same qualitative level. Well, we're right. shooting a TV spot on an 8K red helium so we make a rig out of six 8k heliums and put it on a 50 foot super techno <laughs> yeah. in, in the woods you know an hour and a half outside of toronto and then for that job we were required to deliver a 10k stitch because uh, we we're working with pixvana and they want to push it out through their spin player and what have you so you know we're that's a lot of data you know right five five no six 512 gig mags every you know 20 minutes speaking of which how are you dealing with your data what, what are your, your solutions for, for that? Not only to push it when you're out in the field. Um, Time and a lot of hard drives. Especially with that, like <laughs> with, with dealing with a red, shooting with one camera that's red yeah. is, is yeah. hard enough. <laughs> now, have as many as yeah. that. That's in the woods totally with generators. crazy, yeah. Well, yeah. I'd well, say well, magic Shelley, carry dust praying. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously, yeah. just, yeah. We, we You've have, built proprietary ways of handling, yeah. but it, it's a tremendous amount of data, depending on what level of production. You know, it's like, are we talking about news? Are we talking about a $3 million Facebook commercial? You know, it's, yeah. it's different. But yeah. um, there, there, everything was done manually three years ago. Mm -hmm. And the companies have come in and built proprietary solutions. And now we're getting to, in three short years, to these kind of like generic solutions that are much cheaper. Right? Yeah. So there's been an amazing trend. And faster, too. Like the and data faster. management. Yeah. Like I was in the middle of the desert in Jordan with my laptop and a hard drive. And everything was so simple with the job yeah. algorithm, for example. So you're right. Yeah. Two years ago, <laughs> in the desert, no. Yeah. That, that's one of the things that's hard too is, is data management. One of the things that that I'm always on the road, so I'm always traveling. Generally, um, some most of the pieces that I do are edited from an airplane. So yeah. I'm I jump on an airplane, but if that airplane doesn't have a plug, yeah. But I, I won't even be able to. <laughs> Transcode my my footage before the laptop dies. But you gotta get one of those big yeah. lithium bricks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are just so many challenges. But hopefully, you're seeing some things here at the show that are making yeah. your lives a lot easier. We don't have too much time, but can everybody go around and say what you're most excited to see here? What's going to make your life easier? Um, self stitching, high quality stereo camera. Which one? Right now, the Seacam V1. Looks very promising. Cool. Mm -hmm. We're just going to round robin, so uh, go down I, the line. I think a mixture of fast storage and fast connectivity, like USB C and Thunderbolt 3 and all that. Obviously, we have to move whatever we're shooting mm -hmm. faster. And, and yeah, the same, like better stitching, faster stitching algorithms. The uh, Mystica VR, you know, it's like 60 bucks a month for a subscription for a optical flow s stitching on a laptop. I mean, not in the cloud. That's going to speed things up. Yeah. you know, pretty, pretty awesome. fast. Yeah, there are a lot of good, um, you know, like the, the Google Yee Halo and the Mystica and, and Zcam. Like, we've come so far, so there, there's a lot of good stuff there. I'm, I actually really liked um, Hype VR. This is not going to make anyone's life easier, but <laughs> Hype VR did a, 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 a sample shoot that was a mixture of photogrammetry and live action video mm -hmm. that was really cool. 
so that I can see something. That's that's a definitely a triple A experience, mm -hmm. but that's that was one of the cooler things that I saw for sure. I think definitely what we were touching on earlier as far as data, just having increased you know speeds in computers and enabling us to wrangle that data will be great. Um, and I'm actually interested in seeing the creativity in some of the you know VR tech side uh, companies. You know, just like little things that they're working on, making titling you know more seamless. Even that, something as simple sim simple as that is can be more complicated in 360 because you have you know you have to worry about warping and things like that. So there's lots of little things here that are exciting. Yeah, for me the ZCam is, is interesting from a quality standpoint, but internal stitching is super important for news workflow. Compression mm -hmm. is super important. Mm -hmm. um, the Insta360 Pro camera that just came out is interesting to me just because it does internal stitching. You have outputs, you have a dedicated Ethernet connection, so you can do a lot with a fairly uh, affordable camera for a lot of people. So that's kind of what I'm interested in experimenting. I haven't seen the image quality, but on paper, it, in theory, it sounds like a great camera. It's just a matter of it can perform as well as they say it is. And do, pretty, which camera did you say? The Insta360 okay. Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Just right over there. And at yeah. the, the startup loft, there were actually a lot of um, individuals who were working some things that for VR companies they could use. One was solving for compression. Um, and I don't know if you guys saw the, the Firefly light, which is an LED circular oh, yeah. light yeah. that fits around the tripod. I think it sold for like $2,500 or something like that, which who knows, you might be able to just take LED wrapper lights yeah. and wrap just it around with some, light some yeah. du duct tape and call it around. Around. There are some productions who have already done that, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right yeah. Around that. But it was fascinating yeah. that it, they they had you know come up with a product for that. Mm -hmm. um, I also thought the footage from the uh, the uh, Zcam V1 was very impressive. Their stereo, they shot in yeah. dark on the Las Vegas Strip amazing. with no post-prod, and yeah. the stereo was very comfortable. Yeah. Um, we worked with the, the Zcam S1. We were in Haiti and Ecuador shooting doesn't shut down um, so it's it's fascinating to watch their products and see mm -hmm. yeah we you just know. had it in India for for a week and like all the gear 360s were shutting down and melting and the S1 never turned the off is yes well, well, and we you're saying that the heat coming off of it is a good thing because yeah. it means the heat sinks are working yeah. and so we shot I, with it in Danakil Africa which is the hottest place on earth literally <laughs> and it was fine yeah. well so I think one go. thing yeah. that I will definitely take away is <laughs> no matter where yeah. we are you guys are always pushing two steps ahead, whether the industry is ready for it yeah. or not. So there's a lot of great content out there. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank We're you. out of time, but stick around and let's Thanks. talk. <laughs> we got lots more best practices to share. So thank you for tuning in. We'll be back with Alexander Jenny from Color in a minute.